in chapter 14, which is called Stress, Lifestyle, and Health. It's mostly about stress, though. And in fact, I left out a lot of the real uh, biological components of this stuff to focus more on the psychology. Let's see how fast we can get through this one. Stress. Stress is a process whereby an individual perceives and responds to stressors that they appraise as overwhelming or threatening to their well-being. So the stressor is the event and the perception and the response to this threatening event is stress. When the stressor appears, when it happens, there are two things that happen. First, there's the primary appraisal. This is judging the degree of potential harm. If the stressor is a hungry tiger, that has a very big degree of harm. If the stressor is a quiz for your class tomorrow, there's probably not a huge potential of harm. Then the secondary appraisal happens, and this is where we judge our options. So first we judge how much harm the stressor could do, and then we judge our available options. Right? If the stressor is a tiger, I can fight it, I can run, I can play dead, I can call for help. If the stressor is a test, I can study, I can make an excuse, I can wing it, I can drop out of the class, all different options. So again, primary appraisal is judging the potential harm, how much harm could be caused. The secondary appraisal is judging the available options and how effective they might be. A threat tends to be viewed as less catastrophic if one believes that they can do something about it, right? If you think that it's something that you can handle, if there's an available option, then obviously it's going to be less stressful, less catastrophic. You stress is actually a good kind of stress associated with positive feelings, optimal health and performance. It's sort of like a more of a motivator than stress really. And it's been found that a moderate amount of stress can be beneficial in challenging situations, right? We work a little bit harder if we're stressed, but just not too stressed. So let's look at our flow chart real quick over here. The stressor happens, that's the event, the thing that could cause potential harm, the thing that stresses us out. We provide or we conduct our primary appraisal in our mind. Is this a challenge or is it a threat? If it's a challenge, that's you stress. It's the good kind with potential for gain or growth. But if it's a real threat, the bad kind of stress, this could lead to harm, loss, negative consequences. So now it's time for the secondary appraisal. What can I do to deal with this threat? There's effective options and there's ineffective options, right? If there are effective options, then overall this stressor has low threat. But if there are not good options for handling it, then it has a high threat. I hope that uh, flow chart makes sense. Let's move on to some stressful statistics. The ones from the left I got from your textbook and the ones from the right I found on a few different websites online. Let's look at the ones from your textbook first. It compares levels of stress and how it's changed since the 80s. The most recent data is from 2009, so it would be interesting to see what it's like these days. But we'll just look at these trends for now and notice that in the first graph, Overall, women always have more stress than men. So overall, women are more stressed than men. Moving on to age, overall, the older people have less stress. If you notice, right at the top is under 25, and it gets older and older all the way to the bottom with 65 and up showing the least stress. Don't worry too much about the change over the years. I'm looking more about the trends, right? That the men are always less stressed than women, the older people are less stressed than the younger people. Moving on to race, not surprisingly, white people have less stress than black, Hispanic, or other race. Um, right, as things are easier for you, you're gonna have less stress. Being a man, being white, it's easier in this society. So overall, there's going to be less stress. Moving down to the bottom, we have education. People with more education are less stressed. Employment, people who are unemployed have the most stress. See that yellow at the top is unemployed. They have the most stress. Part-time and full-time kind of fall into the middle there with retired people, which makes sense. Retired people showing the least amount of stress. 
Remember, these are overall. It doesn't mean you cannot have a retired white male who has stress, but these are generalizations or, yeah, basically they're, it's uh, statistics of the group overall. Finally, the last one shows income, and as predicted, the more money you have, the less stressed you are. So once again, I'll just review real quick. Men are less stressed than women, older people less stressed than younger, white people less stressed than people of color, educated people less stressed than uneducated, retired people less stressed than working, and working are less stressed than unemployed. And the more money you have, the less stressed you are. Although we will talk about money and happiness a little bit later. Looking over at the statistics on the right, these are related to the this last year with everybody living through a pandemic. And it's showing the number of people reporting anxiety or depression. And look at the difference between 2019 before COVID and 2021 after COVID jumped all the way from 11% to 41% of adults reporting symptoms of anxiety or depression after spending a year dealing with this global pandemic. Moving down to the second one, essential versus non-essential workers. Look at the symptoms of anxiety or depression. So that dark blue are the essential workers, the people who never got to stay home, the people who had to work even through the scariest time before we even understood what this uh, what this virus was, our essential workers were out there on the front lines and look at how much higher their symptoms of anxiety and depression are. Moving over, they are, were a lot more likely to start or increase substance use during COVID-19, 25% of essential workers versus 11% of non-essential. And then even seriously considering suicide, 22% of essential workers who, were, who took part in this study reported thoughts of suicide compared to only 8% of non-essential workers, which I mean, those numbers are still high even for the non-essential workers, but looking at how much higher it is for essential workers really makes you think. The last graph shows the share of adults reporting um, anxiety or depressive disorder during the COVID pandemic, depending on whether they lost their job or not. So this was all um, taken from 2020 from, uh, sorry, the data was taken in 2021, but people who lost their job during COVID have a 53% of anxiety or depression, whereas people who didn't lose their job is 31%. So if we look very, back up to the top, to that orange bar, we see that about 41% of people had anxiety or depression. But when you look at that broken down into whether they lost their job or not, a lot more likely to have those issues if you have lost your job in this last year during COVID. So those are some statistics and I suggest understanding the COVID ones are more just for your information for your interest or information but for the quiz and the exam it's good to know the different uh, trends from the graphs on the left the things like women having less stress than men or younger people being more stressed than older people. Look at those graphs for a couple minutes and learn them for your quiz. On to a theory of stress, general adaptation syndrome. Hans Selye, I'm never totally sure how to pronounce his name. I've heard it pronounced different ways. I'll say Selye. He's the founder of the International Institute of Stress, and he proposed a three-stage response to stress called general adaptation syndrome. Stage one is alarm. The outside stressor is detected. The body responds by preparing itself, increasing cortisol and adrenaline levels, and we enter that fight or flight stage. Fight or flight is when you can feel that adren adrenaline rushing, your heart is beating, the cortisol is going, and you need to decide, are you going to fight or are you going to flee? Are you going to take off? If you fight, you stand your ground, you defend your position or attack, dig in, persevere, Flight means you flee, you give way, retreat, remove yourself or give up or run away, move on. And of course, flight doesn't mean that you're not tough enough, right? It depends on the situation, fight or flight. It's a, a choice you need to make depending on your skills and abilities and choices and the stressor and the situation. So stage one is called alarm. And during stage one is when we choose fight or flight. 
Should we choose to stay and fight, we go into stage two. If we flee, it's over, right? But if we choose to stay and fight, we go into stage two, which is called resistance. During stage two, the body continues to release cortisol, begins tapping into stores of sugars and fats in order to meet these ongoing demands of the stressors, increases the energy available to deal with the stressors. It's not a long-term thing. This is a short period of time that you have to continue to fight the stressor and deal with it. It can be a physical fight, like fighting off an animal or a bad guy, or it can be an emotional fight where you're defending your position, where you're speaking up for yourself or handling something at work. All of these things are considered fighting the stressor. It's the resistance stage is stage two, where your body taps into your sugars and fats and gives you that extra energy you need to fight the resistance stage. But then comes stage three, exhaustion. Eventually, the body will run out of fats and sugars to draw upon. The long-term release of cortisol has taken its toll, leaving the individual in a weakened state. And if this happens too often, it can lead to maladaptive energy-seeking behaviors. So people who are constantly in stressful situations and constantly needing to stay and fight and make their way through the stages, if they get to stage three of exhaustion and this happens too often, then we, we lead, it leads to things like drug use or caffeine or energy drinks, trying to get more energy after it's been depleted dealing with all of this stress. So that's GAS, General Adaptation Syndrome. It's good to know those three stages. Remember, fight or flight happens during stage one, which is the alarm stage. Now let's talk about different types of stressors. We're going to talk about trauma and everyday hassles and life changes. First, let's look at trauma. Traumatic stressors are when a person is exposed to either actual or threatened death or serious injury. Okay, so to be a traumatic stressor, there needs to be a threat or an actual chance of death or serious injury. Okay, so not, necess- not an emotional thing necessarily. It's a physical thing, this trauma. So things like military combat, threatened or actual physical assaults, terrorist, terrorist attacks, natural disasters, automobile accidents. These are all things that can harm you. Remember, even if it didn't actually happen, if it was a threat to happen, it can cause trauma. Um, PTSD, you're probably familiar with the term, stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Not everybody who endures trauma ends up with PTSD, but it is very common. It's a chronic stress reaction, meaning that it continues to happen. It doesn't just happen when the trauma happens, it sticks around later, the reaction. It's characterized by experiences and behaviors that can include intrusive and painful memories, jumpiness, negative emotional states, detachment from others, angry outbursts, and avoidance of reminders of the event. Thinking of a few people who I know who have been diagnosed with PTSD, they experience, I think, all of these things. So one one man that I know was in the military for a long time in combat zones He has the intrusive and painful memories of the stressor. Jumpiness can happen all the time. Even his own kids can cause him to be startled or jumpy. Persistent negative emotional states, right? Depression, anxiety, then detachment from others, wanting to isolate, not wanting to go out, even agoraphobia where you don't want to leave your home. Angry outbursts can happen, making people with PTSD often difficult to be around, although it's not their fault. It's also, it's still, you know, not fair to their families needing to deal with the angry outbursts and the negative emotional states. And then the avoidance of reminders of the event. So the the person that I'm thinking of doesn't watch any movies with gunshots or explosions. Those kind of things will trigger him. So PTSD, let's look at the pictures on the side. There are some coping strategies as well as treatments and therapies. Some of the coping strategies that you can do on your own are spending time with other people, mindfulness, which is sort of like meditation, exercise, journaling, lifestyle changes, like even eating better or exercising more, 
and then of course counseling or therapy are all different ways that um, people who suffer from PTSD can cope with it. And then should they seek treatment or therapy, there are different ways that professionals handle people with PTSD. They can medicate them, provide psychotherapy, which is like therapy or counseling, right? There's alternative treatments such as yoga or acupuncture, which can actually be quite effective. Virtual reality exposure. I watched a documentary on that recently, a company that does virtual reality to expose people to the trauma that they were originally dealing with. And it helps them uh, handle, sort of unpack all of the emotions when they can virtually experience it without any real threat. And then finally, MDMA assisted therapy is another type of, of medicating to deal with PTSD. So trauma is, of course, a big source of stress for many, many people, and traumatic stressors are a very big deal. Another type of stressor that affects, and this type really affects all of us at some point during our, live, our lives, these are called life changes. Life change stressors are events or situations that require us to make changes in our ongoing lives, and they require time as we adjust to these changes. So these can be small changes like going on a vacation or changing your eating habits, switching schools or beginning a new activity, all the way up to big major changes such as getting married, losing a family member, serving time in jail, divorce. These are bigger life changes, right? So there's something called the SRRS, the Social Readjustment Rating Scale, which measures these 43 potentially stressful life changes. They had different, they had a big sample of people rate how much change it required and how stressful it would be. And then they've even validated these things by correlating it with uh, health effects because of course stress can cause negative effects on your health. And they found that the items with the higher ratings that require bigger life changes, more getting used to, those are more related to health problems as well because they really do cause more stress. So let's look real quick at the very top of the list is death of a spouse with a score of 100. That's the highest score you could get. The biggest change in somebody's life happens if their spouse passes away and it is related to the most changes in health as well since it causes so much stress and takes a lot of time to get used to the changes to adjust. The second one right under death of a spouse would be divorce. You can see it's a big jump from a score of 100 down to only 73, but divorce is still your second biggest one. Losing your partner in life is really the change that takes the most adjustment afterwards. After divorce is marital separation. Then we move down to some other things like a jail term would certainly affect your life in a big way and cause a lot of stress death of a close family member, personal injury or illness, getting married. Well, it's not a bad thing. It's a major stress, right? It, it has a score of 50 because it really changes your life and requires a lot of adjustment and changes to get used to being married versus being sing single. Getting fired from work is another big one, right? Retiring is a big one. Pregnancy is all the way up there at number 12 with a score of 40. Being pregnant can be a very big change in your life. It causes physical changes and lifestyle changes. And can, you know, so that's why that has a fairly high score. If you move down, you'll see things like a child moving out of the house, trouble with in laws, all the way down to really small things like taking a vacation or celebrating Christmas or getting a driving ticket, a traffic ticket. Those are going to cause small amounts of stress and not take very long to adjust to. So we talked about trauma. We talked about life changes. Now let's talk about hassles, the daily hassles that cause us stress. So potential stressors don't always involve major life events. It doesn't always involve a threat to your well-being like trauma. It can, stress can often be caused by daily hassles the minor irritations and annoyances that are part of our everyday lives, but build on one another to leave us stressed. The frequency of daily hassles is actually a better predictor of both physical and psychological health than life change units. 
So we talked about life change on the last slide, right? But they said if you wanted to predict somebody's stress, you'd be better off looking at how frequently they deal with daily hassles than at their actual major life events. So the biggest predictor would be how often you deal with the daily hassles, such as being stuck in traffic, deadlines at work, chores around the house, all those daily stressful stuff that you would have to deal with, paying bills, remembering to get stuff done, appointments, all of those daily hassles can add up and, and build on each other to create lots of stress. Occupational stressors are things that happen at work that stress you. Stressors can include situations in which one is frequently exposed to challenging and unpleasant events, such as difficult, demanding, or unsafe work conditions. So you can see at the top, the two examples I put in the pictures are firefighter and a nurse. Both of those people, or a healthcare worker of sorts, both of those people have to deal with difficult, demanding, and unsafe working conditions. So they would have very high stress jobs. Job strain combines excessive job demands and workload with little decision making or job control. The strain starts to build up and build up as there's more demands, but very little control over your job. The strain builds up and then eventually with too much job strain, someone can experience job burnout. A general sense of emotional exhaustion and cynicism in related to one's job. So the best way to describe job burnout is just being completely over it. When you're totally over it and you just cannot anymore, that's job burnout. Job strain builds up to create job burnout. Different things that can make a job stressful or different types of occupational stressors are needing to travel for work, being responsible for the growth potential, deadlines, working in the public eye, always being watched is a big one, physical demands of a job, competitiveness, hazards that are encountered during your job, the environmental conditions, putting your own life at risk or having other people's lives at risk, right? If you're in charge of other people's lives, like being a firefighter or a healthcare worker, that can cause stress. And then meeting the public can be stressful. All of those are different occupational stressors. You can stop and think about what job you have or you want to have and how many of these stressors it involves. All right, those are all the different types of stressors. Let's quickly discuss some psychophysiological disorders or what they are. Psychophysiological disorders are physical disorders or diseases whose symptoms are brought about or worsened by stress or emotional factors. So they're real diseases, real symptoms, not imagined, not psychosomatic, they're real uh, disorders or diseases, but they're caused by stress or worsened by stress. Things like asthma and depression and heart disease, all of those things, they're real things, even diabetes, real diseases or disorders that can be tested for, but they're caused or worsened by stress. Let me read you Robert Sapolsky's quote real quick. He said, Stress-related disease emerges predominantly out of the fact that we so often activate a physiological si system that has evolved for responding to acute physical emergencies, but we turn it on for months on end. Let's think about that for a minute. He's saying that the reason we have stress-related diseases are because we have this physiological response that deals with stress, right? The cortisol, the adrenaline, the heart pumping, tapping into our fat and sugar reserves, all that stuff we talked about during the fight or flight, right? That's supposed to be a short-term thing. It was our bodies were made, our brains evolved for, to handle that short-term, right? When the tiger runs across our path, we have that short-term stress and now it's over and we can relax. But what Sapolsky's pointing out is that in modern society, we don't get to relax. It's not short-term. Our stress just goes on and on and on, and we tap out on these physical abilities. We tap out on our physical resources because we're needing to use them so often when really it was designed as a once in a while response. So that is why there are so many diseases, especially in modern culture, that are brought on or exacerbated by stress. Back to our definitions. 
Psychoneuroimmunology is the field that studies how psychological factors such as stress influence the immune system as well as immune functioning. Let's look at our picture of the little rat for a second. I found this study really neat. What they did is they gave the rats flavored juice. And of course they had a control group that got regular water, but they gave these rats flavored water. And when they drank the flavored water, they gave them an immune suppressing shot that suppressed their immune system and made them get sick. Not surprisingly, the rats who had the flavored water that suppressed their immune system, they um, start, they became uh, averse to the, to the, to the taste, right? They didn't like the taste anymore. They would avoid that flavor because they created the association between the flavored water and the immune suppressing shot or the immune suppressing reaction of getting sick, right? The, the rats drank the grape flavored water, their immune system was suppressed, they got sick. So in the future, when they're offered grape flavored water, they don't want it because they know it might make them get sick. That part made sense. Here's the really cool part. When they made them drink that grape flavored water after, even without the shot, it actually decreased their immune system. It affected, it suppressed their immune system without the shot. So we essentially, or the researchers essentially trained the rats or conditioned the rats to or condition their immune system, right? So that in the future, when they drink that same flavor of juice, even without any sort of immune suppressing shot, their immune system is gonna go down. So what that shows is we can literally train our immune systems to respond to different things. There've been lots of studies afterwards that validated that, that both animals and humans can condition our immune systems. Last thing on this slide is the telomeres, another really interesting physiological result of stress. Telomeres are segments of DNA that protect the ends of our chromosomes. You don't need to know exactly what they are, but what you do need to know is that shortened telomeres can block cell division, which leads to more rapid aging. Our cells are constantly dividing and making new cells, right? And that cell growth makes us not look as old as quickly. But people with shorter telomeres will not have as much cell division and they will experience more rapid aging. They'll look older for their age. Interestingly, the more stress you endure, the shorter your telomeres. So this explains why people who are very stressed out, people who've had a whole life of stress, often look a lot older than they are. They have shortened telomeres, which block the cell division and leads to rapid aging. There was one study where they found that even adults who had trauma as children had shorter telomeres. You can see in the little graph here. Another study studied the length of telomeres in parents who had chronically ill children versus parents whose children were healthy. And they found that the mothers who had sick children had much shorter telomeres than mothers who had healthy children. And it's because of the stress. So telomere length is what explains why stressed people often look haggard or older than they are. So as I mentioned, stress can cause lots of real physiological disorders, such as hair loss, headache, asthma, heart disease, weight gain, um, digestion issues, diabetes, lots of different physical things that can be caused by stress. Two big ones are asthma and heart disease. Your book goes into detail about that quite a bit if you're interested. The asthma thing is really interesting because stress causes asthma and asthma causes stress. It's a two-way reaction there. Moving on to how we can manage stress. Obviously, we've learned that we all deal with stress, many different stressors between traumatic stressors, life change stressors, daily hassles, occupational stressors. We all have these stressors and we need to learn how to manage them in order to avoid those physiological disorders and reactions we just talked about. So there's two types of coping that you can use when you are managing stress. The first is problem-focused coping. Problem-focused coping is, is managing or altering the problem itself, the stressor. So problem-focused coping skills can involve managing your time, asking for help, making a to-do list, sometimes just getting it done, 
right? Maybe I'm stressed because I didn't finish my work for next week and it keeps stressing me, so I just go do my work. I get it done and I dealt with the problem. The other type of coping is emotion-focused coping. This type doesn't focus on the stressor itself. It focuses on how the person handles it. This is best used when you cannot solve the problem itself, right? If somebody who you're close to passes away, that can cause a lot of stress. You can't bring them back to life. You can't change the problem. So instead you change your emotions. You can do this by exercising, taking a relaxing bath, giving yourself a pep talk or hanging out with people who support you, meditating, different things to help yourself cope. So those are the two types of coping with stress. Problem focused where you actually solve the problem or emotion focused where you cannot or don't want to solve the problem. So instead you focus on how you handle the stressor. So problem focused coping is more likely to occur when we encounter stressors we perceive as controllable, of course, while the emotion focused coping is more likely to occur when we're faced with stressors that we believe we are powerless to change. Right? Whether you really are powerless or you just believe you're powerless, if you think you cannot change the problem itself, you just focus on how you deal with it. Perceived control is our beliefs about our personal capacity to exert influence over and shape our outcomes. So that plays into that, right? Our perceived control. If you have high perceived control, you'll have problem-focused coping. If you perceive your control as low, then you'll work on your emotion-focused coping. Uh, the dog in the picture shows us an example of learned helplessness. First, I'll tell you quickly about that dog experiment. It's quite a famous psychology experiment. They put dogs in a box and administered low levels of electric shocks to the dog with a warning right before it would happen. Many of the dogs were able to jump over the hurdle and escape the electric shock. However, some of the dogs were put into a box where they could not escape the shock. No matter what they did, they wouldn't get away from the shock. I forget if it's because they blocked the hurdle or if because both sides had the shock. I forget the details of the experiment. I believe it's in your book. But the important thing about this is that the dogs who could not escape the shock learned something called learned helplessness. They developed something called learned helplessness. They learned that they can't escape the shock. No matter what they did, they had to endure the shock. So later when the conditions changed and they actually could escape the shock, they didn't even try. They learned that they couldn't escape and they just sat there getting hurt, getting shocked, even though all they needed to do was hop over that little hurdle to get, to get away from it. They had learned in the past that they couldn't get away from it, so they didn't even bother trying. And this happens in humans all the time. People who experience negative life events that they believe they are unable to control may become helpless. As a result, they give up trying to change the situation and some people may become depressed or show lack of initiative in future situations, even ones in which they can control the outcome. So uh, a good example that's often been studied in psychology is in education. Children who believe that they cannot do what they are asked to do at school or who literally cannot do what they've been asked to do in school. They're given work that's too difficult or too challenging. They cannot do it. They learn helplessness. And in the future, when they're given some work that's way easier and they could totally handle, they don't even try because they've learned that they're helpless, that in the past when they tried, it did nothing. So no sense try anymore. Learned helplessness is obviously a bad thing and that's not a good way to handle stress, right? We wanna learn that we should keep trying even if in the past it was not successful. We're almost done, let's talk about social support. We'll move on to happiness. Social support is the soothing impact of friends, family, and acquaintances. Building strong interpersonal relationships with others actually helps us establish our network of close, caring individuals who can provide social support during the bad times, during times of distress, sorrow, and fear. So when things are good, we need to build up that social network so that when things are bad, we have people to call on. During stressful times, our social support network can offer advice, guidance, encouragement, acceptance, emotional comfort, or tangible assistance. That means actual help with the problem. 
maybe I'm stressed because I can't pay my bills. So while it's nice that my mom might tell me, you got this, you can do it, and I accept you even if you can't pay your bills, what's really nice is if she can loan me some money. That's tangible assistance, the real, like, physical help. It's not always the best kind of help, but it can be, right? But the social support network provides all of those things, very important during times of stress. Individuals with stronger social relationships actually have a 50% greater likelihood of survival compared to those with weak or insufficient social relationships. Like survival, like literally meaning not dying. There's a study they talk about in your book where they found that people who reported very high levels of loneliness were 50% more likely to die in the next year than people who didn't, right? So social support gives you a 50% increased chance of living longer. It also increases your immunity, lowers anxiety and depression, increases self-esteem and empathy, gives you better emotional regulation skills, and social connection creates positive feedback, really, really lots of benefits of having social connections. If you look at the other picture on the right, we talk about the dangers of low social connection, the other side. If you don't have social support, you may have worse health. Um, it's, oh, so yeah, you may have worse health even than somebody who smokes or has high blood pressure is obese. They're saying not having social connections is even worse for your health than smoking. I didn't know that before I had found this, um, this website where I got this from. Uh, not having social connections also creates higher inflammation at the cellular level. That's a real physical thing like swelling, inflammation, higher susceptibility to anxiety and depression, of course, suicide, antisocial behavior, violence, slower recovery from disease. So there really are so many benefits of social support. I know we talked about in a previous chapter how social support is the biggest thing that will predict not getting addicted to drugs. So I know it's a lot easier said than done to create this social network. Not everyone can just go out there and hold up a sign saying, I'm looking for friends. But it's really important in your life to try to create this social network that can support you during the stressful times. Because as you can see, there are really a lot of benefits of having high social connections and a lot of dangers of having low social connection. Social support appears to work by boosting our immune system, especially among people who are experiencing stress. Social support has also been shown to reduce blood pressure for people who are performing stressful tasks. So what's that, what that's saying is that the benefits and the dangers are more pronounced if you're dealing with a lot of stress. The benefits are even better and the dangers are even worse for people who are dealing with a lot of stress. All right, last part is happiness. Happiness is an enduring state of mind consisting of joy, contentment, and other positive emotions, plus the sense that one's life has meaning and value. So let's look at the Venn diagram, the circles over on the right side. Happiness is the intersection of pleasant life, good life, and meaningful life. Those are the three things that interact to make happiness. So pleasant life means enjoying daily pleasures. Of course, having money makes this easier, but it can be done without money, right? Enjoying your life, pleasant life. Good life means using your skills for enrichment, actually bettering yourself. So good means better. You're always getting better, having a good or better life. And then meaningful life is contributing to the greater good, helping others, helping society, leaving this world a better place than when you got here. Combining all three of those types of life, pleasant life, good life, and meaningful life will lead to true happiness. I mentioned money a minute ago when I talked about pleasant life and our daily pleasures. But if we look at this graph at the bottom, we can see that in the U.S., happiness does increase as income increases, but we plateau, we, we tap out at 75K. Once somebody's making $75,000 a year, they're no less happy than someone making $175,000 a year. So basically, this sort of brings us back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? When you make enough to meet your basic needs, when you don't have to be real stressed about food and shelter and basic safety, all of those basic needs, after that, money does not increase your happiness. 
but it will cause unhappiness if you have so little money that you cannot even take care of your basic needs. So let's look at our overall. These are some trends, just like we talked about the trends about stress earlier. Overall, older people are happier than younger people. Married people are happier than single or divorced or widowed. Wealthy people happier than poor, but again, only to an extent, only up to 75K in the US. Residents of affluent countries are happier than poor countries. This is a much bigger difference in money. Within a country, the difference between the poor people and the rich people doesn't show a huge difference in happiness. But between countries, people in wealthier countries are much happier than people in poorer countries. That effect is much bigger. Also, happy people tend to have more friends. And of course, we just talked about all those benefits of having friends and social relationships. Although these are all correlations, right? We don't necessarily know what happens first. Are you happy because you have more friends or do you have more friends because you're a happy person? We don't know the direction. We just know the correlation. Education is positively correlated with happiness. So people who have are more highly educated are happier. Religious people are happier. However, only in countries where people struggle to meet their basic needs. So in countries where a lot of people... Um, like third world countries, you know, more poor countries where people really struggle to meet their basic physical and safety needs. In those countries, religious people are happier. But in countries like the United States, where we're generally considered a wealthy country, and most people are not fighting for their basic needs, religious people are not happier or less happy. It's just it's not related. Next, having desirable characteristics increases happiness. So if the society that you live in values hard work and you're a hard worker, you're going to be happy. If the, if the society you live in values being in good physical shape and you're in good physical shape, you'll be more happy, right? Basically, if you fit in, if you have what everybody's looking for, you're going to be happier. Interestingly, there are no gender differences for happiness. We saw earlier with stress that women have more stress than men, but there are no gender differences for happiness. There are also no IQ differences for happiness. So education differences, yes, but intelligence, intelligence differences, no. All of that about happiness. Last slide before our summary talks about positive psychology, which is literally the science of happiness. How can you not be happy if you're a positive psychologist? Some of the topics studied by positive psychologists include altruism, right? Being good, a good person doing for others is altruism. Empathy, creativity, forgiveness and compassion, the importance of positive emotions, as well as the enhancement of immune system functioning. So we found that happiness actually Im improves our immune system. So part of positive psychology is looking into that immune system stuff. Positive affect is defined as, the, as pleasurable engagement with the environment, happiness, joy, enthusiasm, alertness, and excitement. All of those good feelings are positive affect. Nev negative affect would be the bad things, sadness, fear, disgust, all of those negative emotions. But positive affect are our positive emotions. Positive psychological well-being is linked with a range of favorable health out outcomes especially improved cardiovascular health. So just like stress can cause lots of bad health outcomes, positive psychological well-being can cause lots of good health outcomes. Optimism is a little bit different than positive affect because positive affect is literally just experiencing the positive stuff, right? Feeling happy or joy or enthusiasm. Optimism is a general tendency. It's more of a component of your personality. It's a significant predictor of positive health outcomes. And it's a general tendency to look on the bright side of things, to feel a tendency to have more positive affect than negative affect, even in the same situation. And finally, f flow is a state involving intense engagement in an activity. It's real, it can result in a lot of happiness it's usually experienced when participating in creative work or a leisure endeavor. If you ever really get into something, a craft you're working on or a sport or a game, even a, a TV show or something that you're really enjoying, 
the activity, you get so engaged that you sort of feel almost this, this happiness high that's called flow because you're just enjoying yourself so much that you just really feel happy. Time for our summary. As usual, I will pause for a second, take a sip of water. Okay, chapter 14, summary. Stress is the process whereby an individual perceives and responds to events that you appraise as overwhelming or threatening to your well-being. Remember that primary appraisal is the judgment about the potential harm or threat of the stressor. And the secondary appraisal is judging the options available to cope with the stressor. Fight or flight response is the physiological reaction that happens when we encounter the stressor, which forces us to decide whether we should, that actually says flight or flight. I just noticed the typo. I will fix that. It should say fight or flight. Those physiological reactions, the cortisol and the adrenaline that cause us to choose, should we stay and fight or should we leave and flee? General adaptation syndrome talks about three stages of our body's response to stress. The first one is the alarm reaction. During that stage, we decide fight or flight. Second is the stage of resistance. If we do stay to fight during stage two, the stage of resistance, our body taps into our fat and sugar stores continues to pump cortisol and gives us the energy it takes to fight. But if we keep fighting through that whole stage of resistance, eventually we'll reach the stage of exhaustion where we're tapped out on all of our resources and cannot fight anymore. And as I mentioned earlier, continual reaching of the stage of exhaustion will cause people to seek energy increasing behaviors such as drugs or caffeine or energy drinks. You stress is the good form of stress that motivates us and keeps us challenged. Traumatic stressors are when a person is exposed to actual or threatened death or serious injury. Traumatic stressors can cause PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a chronic stress reaction. It continues. It lasts for many, many months or years. It can cause irritability and anger and avoidance of things that remind you of the trauma and PTSD has lots of different possible coping mechanisms and treatments, including medication and psychotherapy and virtual reality and yoga and meditation, lots of different ways to handle PTSD. Moving on to life change stressors. These are the events or situations that happen in our lives where we need to make changes. They require time to adjust to those changes. If you remember the biggest life change stressor, that cause the most stress is death of a spouse, moving down to lower things that cause very little stress, but still some, such as Christmas or a vacation. The SRRS is that list that I'm just talking about that puts those all of the different life change stressors in order of how stressful they are. And it's been um, it's been validated by being correlated with different health outcomes as well. Another kind of stress are daily hassles. These are the minor irritations or annoyances that are part of our everyday lives, but they build on one another, leaving us stressed. Uh, talking about occupational stressors, we, those are things that happen at work. We can experience job strain, which combines excessive job demands and workload with little decision-making capabilities or job control. A lot of job strain could eventually lead to job burnout where you just cannot anymore. It's a general sense of emotional exhaustion and cynicism in relation to one's job, just totally over it. Over onto the right side, psychophysiological disorders are real physical disorders that are worsened or brought on by stress or emotional factors, such as asthma or heart disease. Psychoneuroimmunology is the study of how psychological factors such as stress can influence our immune system. Remember, we talked about how our immune system can be conditioned like the rat's immune system was. Telomeres are segments of DNA that protect our chromosomes. Shortened telomeres can block or inhibit cell division, which leads to more rapid aging. Telomeres are shorter in stressed people. So the reason that very stressed out or chronically stressed people often age quickly or look older than they are is because they have shortened telomeres which block the cell division. 
stress can cause many different uh, psychophysiological disorders such as asthma, cardiovascular disease, headaches, depression, hair loss, diabetes, digestion issues, lots of them. There are different ways to cope with stress. The two main types of coping are problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. Problem-focused is when you manage or alter the problem itself, the stressor, whereas emotion-focused coping are efforts to change or reduce the negative emotions associated with the stress. If you can't change the problem, you can change your reaction. Perceived control or our beliefs about our personal capacity to exert influence over or shape the outcomes. If you think you can control the outcome, you're more likely to use the problem-focused coping. If you have low perceived control, you'll do the emotion-focused coping. Learned helplessness are when people who experience negative life events that they believe they are unable to control, they become helpless, and even when they experience things that they can control, they don't even try. This was like those poor doggies getting the shocks in the box, the ones who could not escape the shock, even later on when they could escape the shock, didn't try. They had learned helplessness. Social support is the soothing and often beneficial support of others. It can take different forms, such as getting advice or guidance, encouragement or pep talks, acceptance from people who we know, emotional comfort, and then tangible assistance, actually helping us with what we need, right? If a friend goes and gets my groceries because I'm stressed out that I don't have enough time, that would be tangible assistance. Social support, as we talked about, is very, very important and has lots of benefits. And a lack of social support has a lot of negative consequences, including being 50% more likely to die. Happiness is defined as the enduring state of mind consisting of joy, contentment, and other positive emotions the sense that one's life has meaning and value. Remember, happiness is the combination of the happy life and the good life and the meaningful life all together create happiness. We looked at the different uh, trends in happiness as well, right? We saw there were not gender or IQ differences, but there were other differences in happiness, including people who have more money are happier, but only until a certain point in the US that's 75 grand a year. Positive affect is the pleasurable engagement with the environment, feeling good things like happiness and excitement. Optimism is a personal tendency toward a positive outlook and positive expectations. Flow is a state involving intense engagement in an activity, usually experienced when participating in creative work or leisure endeavors. It's a good feeling. And finally, positive psychology, the study of happiness area of study seeking to identify and promote qualities that lead to happy, fulfilled, and contented lives.